Welcome to another edition of In Deep. I'm Angie Cairo. The nation is finally paying appropriate attention to the horrendous execution of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin of Florida. Behind this one incident, beyond the outrage, there's the deeper story of what Americans of all colors see when a black man goes by. The challenge of being young, black, and male in America, that's our topic this hour on In Deep. It's time for our blogger spotlight, and we turn our attention to Matt Gertz at Media Matters, where he's deputy research director and head of guns and public safety unit. And, and Matt, welcome to the show. The reason we brought you on is because you've neatly tied together two issues that we've been following. One is the Trayvon Martin case. The other is Alec. And Alec, for our listeners who haven't caught up, is the ghostwriter behind so much legislation that pops up around the country in service of the conservative point of view. And, and you have actually found the link there behind the gun laws that Zimmerman is is hiding behind in the Trayvon Martin case. And Alec, what's that link there? Well, generally, we think of Alec as promoting more of this uh, pro-corporate legislation, you know, that they receive a lot of money from uh, major companies, and then they go out to the states and try to push different legislation through for their benefit. But one of the main uh, partner groups that has always funded ALEC is actually the National Rifle Association. And, you know, ALEC is the sort of organization in which you get what you pay for. So NRA has uh, given them a lot of money in the past, and in turn, ALEC has been uh, very much willing to sort of uh, promote legislation that the NRA likes all over the country. In this particular case, um, the law that uh, may prevent George Zimmerman from ever being successfully prosecuted is Florida's Stand Your Ground law. And that's a law that says uh, basically that if you think that you uh, are in jeopardy, wh whether you actually are or not, then you have no duty to retreat and you can stand your ground and basically shoot people. Um, now, this law was passed in 2005 in Florida at the behest of the NRA. Uh, it was uh, supported by virtually every member of the, I believe it passed unanimously through the Florida State Senate and uh, received a lot of support in the State House and was signed by, Je by Jeb Bush. Florida is actually uh, one of the states where the NRA has a, a, the strongest possible foothold. So after this law was passed uh, in Florida itself, the NRA decided, well, you know what, it would be great to try to push similar legislation through in the rest of the country. So they went to ALEC. Uh, Marion Hammer, the NRA lobbyist who uh, supported the law in Florida, went to ALEC and said, you should take this up as model legislation. And ALEC did, and ever since, they've been pushing it across the country. And, and you have a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, let me just give our, our, our listeners a taste of that. This is from your column. The language in Florida law which may protect Martin's killer from prosecution states. This is just the first line. A person who's not engaged in an unlawful activity and who is attacked in any other place where he or she has a right to be. I'm going to leave, leave it there because we go down to the Alec Castle Doctrine Act modeled on that. A person who is not engaged in an unlawful activity and who is attacked in any other place other than dwelling residence or vehicle. It's not word for word identical, but clearly used as a pattern here. What's ironic to me, Matt, I'm hearing even as late as today, I heard an ABC News analyst, apparently with a legal and legislative background, who said, well, this is a very unusual and peculiar law in Florida. Um, no, it's not. This is what, 23 states now? Is that accurate? Uh, I, I think that is accurate. I know that it's been, uh, at least uh, I've seen reported uh, the number 16 uh, since Florida passed theirs. And I think that their law is somewhat more extensive than some of those others that's included in the 23 figure. Um, but yes, this is actually, uh, I mean, it, it's peculiar in as much as you can't imagine why someone would think that this was actually a smart thing to pass into law. Uh, but as far as it, it, it is popping up everywhere now, there are several states right now in which uh, there are debates going on about whether or not such a law will be passed. Uh, Minnesota, uh, Governor Mark uh, Dayton uh, vetoed legislation that had passed uh, Minnesota's uh, House and Senate, I, I think, just uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, there are still debates going on now in Iowa and in Alaska and I think possibly a few other states uh, to pass uh, legislation very similar to uh, what's happening in, in Florida right now. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the NRA has been putting out press release after press release supporting all of these bills even after Trayvon Martin's death. Um, that, that, that has not paused them at all. And uh, I, I mean, this, this is obviously dangerous legislation that can prevent uh, killers from being, uh, from uh, 
uh, meeting justice, and and that's kind of a shame that uh, we're we're seeing uh, such a spread uh, throughout the country. Of course, the only good thing that we can imagine, the only thing that would make the Martin family whole, is to have their child back. They're never going to get his child back, their child back, but. It strikes me that this at least might be some small way that Alex's larger corporate, dare I say, manifesto is going to be made public as people are going to understand that this is working throughout other states. Are you going to continue to be staying on top of Alex? Is this something that you're going to keep pursuing? Oh, I think absolutely. And I know that organizationally, we've uh, focused also on Alex's role in uh, voting rights legislation recently and in several other areas. It's certainly... Uh, this is the sort of thing where if you don't shine a spotlight uh, on what's going on, the cockroaches take over. And so we will certainly keep an eye out. I really appreciate the work you're doing, Matt Gertz, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Matt Gertz is with Media Matters. We're going to put a link to his blog piece on our website at indeepradio.com. He works with Media Matters as their deputy research director, the head of guns and public safety unit as well. You can also follow us on Facebook, In Deep with Angie Coiro. Our Twitter account can be followed as well, at In Deep Radio. We will see you there. This is In Deep. I'm Angie Coiro. Like so many news shows this week, we are focusing on the case of Trayvon Martin. What happened to that young man is still officially a mystery. There certainly seems to be an awful lot of facts coming out that in the eyes of the Twitterverse, in the eyes of the Internet, in the eyes of civil rights people, should have come out in a basic investigation by the police when a man who stylized himself as a captain of a local neighborhood watch who called the police and said that this young man was acting suspiciously, it turned out said young man was 17 years old and had nothing on his person besides a bag of candy, an iced tea, and a cell phone. There's some dispute as to whether in this call to 911, the pursuing man, George Zimmerman, actually used a racial epithet. He did identify Trayvon Martin as black. And this is where the story turns murky. Despite the disparity in size, with Trayvon Martin being on the smaller side and George Zimmerman being a husky man of superior height, Zimmerman does claim that he was attacked from behind by this young boy, thus justifying his use of a gun. And it turns out that in Florida, and as we heard earlier in this show from Matthew Gertz of MediaMatters.org, the Stand Your Ground gun law, under which George Zimmerman is apparently expected to defend himself, would allow him to use force had he felt threatened. And that appears to be what the police took for granted. The police did not do an investigation. They did not arrest him. They did not revoke his concealed carry permit. As of this record date, we record this on Thursday for broadcast over the weekend, there is no word yet that that carry permit has been revoked. Although an address has been floated on Twitter and throughout the Internet as the location where Zimmerman is hiding, that's not been confirmed. In short, a lot of mysteries remain here. But one thing is not a mystery, and that is that there is an element of racism here. If anyone finds that arguable, They are welcome to contact me at indeepradio.com. You'll find an array of email addresses there. But I think for the sake of this discussion, we can assume that Trayvon Martin was profiled. We heard it in the report from the 911 call. So we're going to take that conversation from there and talk about the underpinnings in society that bring about a situation like this, not just the fact that the police investigation was wanting, but that there's so much more here that needs to be plumbed and exposed and discussed, and at some point, God willing, in the future, will be healed. Let me introduce my guest to you. In the studio here, we have Dory Maynard. She's the president of the Robert C. Maynard Institute for Journalism Education in Oakland, California. She's also the co-author of Letters to My Children. That's a compilation of columns by her late father, Robert Maynard. And we have on the line from San Francisco, Dr. Joe Marshall, and he is the founder of the Omega Boys Club, co-founder of the Boys Club, of the Alive and Free Movement, and he also is with the Street Soldiers National Consortium, founder and president of that group as well. Dr. Marshall, welcome. Uh, You might also add that I'm also, and this may uh, be interesting to the listeners, I'm also the vice president of the San Francisco Police Commission. So (laughs) I'm all over this kind of thing. (laughs) 
Good. All the more reason to have you with us. And, and Dory, I'm so pleased to have you here because of your long experience with media and journalism. And let's let's talk about that aspect first, if we can. And Matt, our engineer, has ready a, a, a piece of sound. When you and I were first talking on the phone, Dory, we were talking about Matt Lauer's interview of the parents who made their first public appearance on his show. And as a journalist, I understand there was a need to establish, to address that some people were saying, well, he had to be doing something. Nobody just gets shot for no good reason. But it was the way that he approached it that may be questionable. So let's hear that little bit of sound, and then we'll discuss it. I know you've asked yourself this question a thousand times. What could have happened that night between these two men, your son and Mr. Zimmerman, that resulted in this tragedy? When you think of any possible scenario, is there one you can come up with in your mind where your son actually tried to harm that neighborhood volunteer? No, I cannot. Um, I just can say that I'm pretty sure my son tried to get away. Um, he didn't know who this guy was. Um, He's seen him as a stranger. So he was trying to um, just get away from the situation. Anything in your son's past, Ms. Fulton, any run-ins with the law, anything going on in his life at the time of the shooting that might have had him in a different state of mind, an agitated state? No, he was never agitated. He had never had a run-in with the law. Um, he was mild-mannered. He was a nice kid. When you And I know you didn't want to listen to the tape this morning. You have heard it, but you asked us not to play it for you this morning. But you heard Mr. Z- Zimmerman at one point on that tape saying about your son, he's up to no good, there's something wrong with this guy. What do you think he was reacting to? He was act- reacting to the color of his skin. Um, He committed no crime. My son wasn't doing anything but walking on the sidewalk. And I just don't understand why this situation got out of control. The father of Mr. Zimmerman says that his son is not now and never has been a racist. We're going to uh, interrupt that at this point because it's pretty much established to start with you, Dory. What I felt was handled badly. I can understand wanting to address any assumptions that were out there, but it sounded to me as though... The parents were immediately questioned with, what the heck did your kid do? It sounded like a grilling, like it, like an interrogation to me. Well, it did have that sound. And I think to put it into some context, what was striking to me was, I think, two segments earlier. The Today Show did a piece on the alleged F- uh, shooter in Afghanistan. And in that piece, they had neighbors talking about, you know, you wouldn't have thought it would have been, this guy would have done anything wrong. They really humanized him, which I think, you know, show the complete picture of the person under any circumstances. That's a good idea. That was a man accused of killing 16 people, women and children. Trayvon Martin is dead. And there was nothing in that segment with Matt that humanized that child, that gave any sense of who he was. It was all sort of Mr. Zimmerman, got, they certainly talked about who Mr. Zimmerman was, the part that you uh, stopped, you know, was he a racist or, you know, his father says he wasn't, again, giving some nice human details to who Mr. Zimmerman is, but nothing for Trayvon, no, nothing, tell us about your son, he was a football player. And this coverage, at least on the Today Show, has continued. Even today, they did another segment uh, looking at the, the the legal ramifications of the case. And in the lead up to that, once again, they had some humanizing uh, details on Mr. Zimmerman, a neighbor saying, I can't believe he's, he's not the kind of guy who would shoot him. I mean, they also had some other details that suggested that Mr. Zimmerman had um, been arrested for domestic assault, I believe. Mm-hmm. But again, nothing about Trayvon other than prove to us he was not a criminal proved to us that he didn't do any that, that he wasn't complicit in his own murder guilty until proven innocent yes exactly dr marshall is that what you heard well it's, it's interesting because see I, i'm used to that i hear it all the time uh it seems the way these things go the victim or the, and it happens in a lot of cases whether it be to me it's a rape victim or it's it, it it's less about the one who, the the one who who something happened to than is about the one who was accused of doing something and so uh, that line of questioning comes up a lot when these interviews you because people are trying to figure out 
he must have done something to brought to have brought this on. So uh, you've got to prove yourself in many cases, you know, uh, uh, innocent um, before you know. You must. You yeah. I, I hear that a lot. And so yeah, I, I heard that, and, and you know, I think Ms. Burke is pretty much. Uh, it's not about Trayvon. It's about this other gentleman who. You know, couldn't have done this really. <laughs> Why would he have done something to this young man unless he was this, you know, this criminal? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, to Dr. Marshall's point, it is very much like the coverage around rape victims. What, you know, had you been drinking? Uh, how short was your skirt? Right. Uh, but, you know, we don't see that around muggings or other things that involve, uh, you know, other sorts of crimes. People don't say, and a friend of mine was telling me about a video where they have, uh, oh, they show a white male who's been mugged, and it's it's a spoof, and they're saying to the person, well, you know, why were you walking in that area? Or why were you wearing a suit that displays how much wealth you have? <laughs> I hadn't seen that. It, well, it, That's powerful. It, it is a great video, and I'm going to, I will look for it. So, yes, I think when we are looking at crimes against marginalized people, we are often saying, well, what did you do to deserve it? But I think there are other crimes where we do, where our coverage is much more, you know, uh, much more straightforward. Uh, Dr. Joseph Marshall, we have just about two and a half minutes until we go to our break. And I, I'm just going to start this conversation with you and we'll continue it further. If we were to recreate the experience of this young man, I had a conversation with my husband once, and he told me how much it saddened him that just as your average white guy walking down the street, it made him sad when women would see him coming and cross the street so as not to be on the street with a strange man. I can, I can only begin to imagine that must be, you know, twice or three times as difficult if you're a young black man as opposed to a young man. Um, I don't have to recreate Trayvon's experience. I can recreate my own. <laughs> <laughs> you know, growing up, and I grew up in, you know, in, in South Central Los Angeles, and I, I and I walk the streets, and basically, you're scared the whole time. I mean, you, you're not only scared of of, of, of 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 white men or the police; you're scared of black men. <laughs> you're scared of everybody because uh, you're 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 pretty much uh, a target uh, to for just about everybody out there, and you know uh, whether it be authority figures or somebody who looks just like you. So yeah. It's 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 it really literally is a jungle out there, and you're trying to navigate that jungle, and you got to have you know you worry about having your antenna up, and you see people when when, when uh, a light shines on you, your first thought is why. So I, I I'm I pretty much understand Got Trayvon's mindset as he was walking these streets, and somebody comes up on him because this happened to me. Uh, you just hope that it's not a a bad encounter, and in this case, it seems like it was. We're going to pick up this conversation uh, with Dr. Joseph Marshall, who is on the line from us in San Francisco. He's the executive director of the Omega Boys Club and the Street Soldiers. We also have in studio Dory Maynard, who's president of the Robert C. Maynard Institute for Journalism Education here in Oakland, California. We're going to, at the end of this right now, we're going to hear a little bit from the floor speech in the House in Washington, D.C., of Congresswoman Frederica Wilson addressing this event. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the time. Mr. Speaker, I am tired of burying young black boys. I am tired of watching them suffer at the hands of those who fear them and despise them. I'm tired of comforting mothers, fathers, grandparents, sisters, and brothers after such unnecessary, heinous crimes of violence. Welcome back to In Deep. I'm Angie Coiro talking with my guests about the shooting of Trayvon Martin and what it tells us about our society, the issues that it urges us to look at. Uh, Talking with Dr. Joseph Marshall on the line in San Francisco and Dory Maynard here in Berkeley, California. Dr. Marshall, when we left off, I was asking about the experience of a young black man walking down the street, how they're perceived, what they fear. And you talked about your own experiences growing up in South Central L.A., and I guess I would like to have believed that, you know, from the generations between now and then, that there had been some improvement. But I understand this is what you still hear through your work with Omega and the street soldiers, that that hasn't changed. No, unfortunately, it hasn't. It, uh, the, 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 the 
the battle still continues. Uh, you know, the streets are unsafe uh, for a lot of young black men, uh, and it doesn't often seem to matter where you are, whether it's in your, na- on your, in your own neighborhood, in somebody else's neighborhood. It's a perception that people have of you, um, and that perception is fueled by a lot of times the way you know the way you look, the way you dress, the way they think, the way they see, you know what they've seen on the news. Uh, they don't necessarily look upon you as an individual. Uh, it's perception of, of what's going on inside of them, and so um, in this case, it, it seems like this person, you know, thought this kid was a, you know, a, a criminal, and why he thought that, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what fueled him to think that. Uh, he was certainly told, it seems like, not to, not to, and, you know, follow the, follow the young man. Um, the young man didn't have a gun. I, maybe his fears rose to, you know, to the point where I, I, that's what we're trying to find out. But no, any, any young black man that walks out there has an idea of what's going on in other people's minds and he's just hoping it doesn't bump into him. Uh, Dr. Marshall has has hit, uh, Dory Maynard, Dr. Marshall has hit on the media depiction of black men, what people see in the news, you know, how, and all of us are judged by how we're portrayed in the media. You know, for example, as, as a heavyset woman, you know, there are certain images that, that I am up against because thin is in, that sort of thing. All of us face media depictions. What have you seen in the terms of how uh, young black men are depicted in the media that you think may have contributed to this situation or that just come to mind for you with this situation? Well, content audit after content audit has shown that black men are overrepresented in stories about crime, uh, also sports and entertainment. And by overrepresented, I mean they are overrepresented of their involved, their actual real life involvement in crime. The face of crime has become black and brown men. Uh, on the flip side, they are underrepresented in stories about business, lifestyle, everyday life. Uh, you do not see. Uh, uh, stay-at-home fathers or fathers at all, or rarely. You know, you rarely see uh, newspaper editors, ad executives. It's a very marginalized point of view. Um, the the uh, latest pr- people to do a content audit study was the Opportunity Agenda, just published it, um, or just released in uh, December, I believe, the exact same findings as we've been finding. And on the digital side, it's it's following the same uh, out, uh, pattern as you found in traditional media. There was a 2000 study that looked at the effects of watching local news, crime news, and racial attitudes, and it found that the more people consumed local news, which is, has a great deal of crime in it, which, as I just said, is often uh, full of young black and brown men, uh, their racial attitudes hardened. They uh, had much more negative attitudes towards African Americans. And this is happening not only with men, but with younger men and younger and younger men. We just did a story last summer where we found a, a television station, a Chicago a CBS affiliate in Chicago, twisted a four-year-old, four-year-old African American boy's words to make it sound as if he wanted to grow up to be a criminal. They were doing an overview of some murders, and the anchors say, you know, one murder was witnessed by a child as young as four who had a disturbing reaction. And then you cut to the film, and you see a little boy saying, I'm not afraid of anything. And you hear a voice in the, you know, off camera saying, well, when you get older, are you going to stay away from guns and violence? The child says no. The off-camera voice says, what are you going to do? The child says, I'm going to have me a gun. A little while later, you go to the anchors who say things like, "Very." Dis- they ran it twice. Once it was very, very disturbing. Another time, somebody, uh, the female anchor said, that tells the whole story. Well, in fact, it didn't tell the whole story because we got the tape. Right after the child says, I'm going to have me a gun, the off-camera voice says, you are. Why are you going to do that? And the child says, because I'm going to be the police. That sounds almost agenda driven. That doesn't. And I, I'm not a conspiracy type. I've worked in a newsroom. I know a lot of stuff doesn't come down from the top, and there's you know there's a way to depict these things. But that is a very peculiar well, editorial choice. I doubt it was. A, I I mean I I doubt the anchors knew what they were seeing. Uh, I or you know knew how that piece had been cut. Uh, 
I do think that their initial reaction was a result of having been fed so many of these images that after a while you build up an unconscious bias and you just begin to believe that this distorted and skewed picture of boys and men of color, and again, this was a four-year-old, is the reality. Yeah, I just want to, and that's the, the, the points are, are well said. Because it's not a balanced portrayal, there comes to be a lens through which you see a certain population, a certain group. And that, and, and, and that lens, and this is, <laughs> we can put this word in parentheses, I mean, in, in quotation my colors, the way, you, the way you see them. In this case, especially with, 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 with black and brown young men, there's the rule and there's the exception, okay? But what predominates with a lot of people is this rule, and that rule is because of what they're subjected to all the time. Obama is the exception, <laughs> mm-hmm. okay? Everybody else is the rule. So, uh, and, and, but everybody feels that way. I mean, a lot of police, um, unless, you, unless you're in touch with that, that's just, it's not even sometimes unconscious, it's conscious for a lot of folks, or semi-conscious. So, you know, law enforcement feels that way. Uh, uh, other other young men in the neighborhood feel that way about other young men. I mean, that's why there's so much beef with young men against other young men. It's the lens that they see that we're that we're shown through all the time. In fact, and, and we're not allowed to show the other lens because good news doesn't sell. So why would you portray somebody like that? So no, it, it all of this works against us, and that's what we're always fighting as black men all the time. Mm-hmm. And, and Dr. Marshall's point, and I try to make this when I go out and I talk to journalists about better depiction, a more accurate and fair depiction. This is an issue of accuracy, credibility, and fairness, which are at the heart of journalism tenets. But we don't have to do positive stories. We just have to make sure that when we are doing stories, we are including African American and Latino men. We know every year, without fail, Christmas is going to come. And we're going to do stories on Christmas shoppers. Well, there's a perfect opportunity to make sure that you're showing the totality of shoppers. Mm -hmm. We also know every year there's going to be Father's Day. I mean, there are so many ways of making sure that you are including the totality of your community in your coverage. We do stories about gas prices. I mean, there are all kinds of ways you can remind your audience that black and brown men do not only live on the fringes of society, they live in the middle of society. Well, let's talk about the entertainment angle of that, because as you've been talking, I was thinking about my favorite TV show, and the favorite TV show of many people in this country is Mad Men right now. Brilliantly written. It's a great piece of theater. It goes a lot further into depth in, into you know personalities than, than you'll see on, say, a comedy show. The depiction of black people has been notable in its omission. It is something that is set in the 1960s in an advertising agency, and the creator, Matthew Weiner, has said, look, there just were not that many black people there. However, even though that may be accurate, you know, you're not going to see a black guy in an ad agency in 1962, at the same time, when there was a mugging, and it was a hyped-up black guy on drugs, my heart still clenched, even though it's probably, I don't, I don't accurate? I don't know. Uh, I don't think it was accurate. And I just re-saw that episode the other morning and had that exact same reaction. They, If you're not going to, if you're going to say that black people were invisible during that period, then I think you have an obligation to make sure that the only person you show mugging is not African American. I grew up in New York. Trust me. It was, you know, there were muggers of all races. They had white muggers in New York? Wow. Yes, they did, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Yes, they did. So I I thought that that was was disturbing. And there are other ways that Mad Men could have brought in people of color. Mm -hmm. They just, that wasn't their choice. Uh, Yeah, please. If I I can throw into this. I I, I think a, a good way of looking at this is any time, and this has happened maybe, what, several times in the last few years where someone has committed a crime that they did and to get the onus off themselves who do they perpetrate or invent that did the crime a black male in a and automatically people say oh yeah that probably could have happened you know and 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 until the investigation reveals that no it was actually you people just i mean the fact that they go to that immediately mm-hmm. says something about it. They don't say, you know, an Asian male, they don't say this, because they know they got a chance of taking it off them with that image out in front of them. That says a lot. 
And again, you know, Dr. Marshall, I'm coming back to you essentially with the same question again, but I'm trying to grasp what it must be like to grow up as a young kid to have this burden thrust on you from the day you're cognizant. I mean, I, I, I just don't understand what kind of burden that must be. And I'm not talk, just talking about Trayvon Martin. I'm talking about any child of color growing up with that sort of presumption about who he is and what he is when he, you know, commits the mere act of walking into a room. Oh, you get warped. You get warped. Unless there's somebody to help you with it. Because, what, because see, you start to believe it yourself. It's easy for you to believe that, you know, that, you're, you know, that, that that's what you are because that's what everybody says you are. And, and then you start to, to live down to that, if that's a good way to put it. The way you think, the way you act, you, be, you, 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 you know, perception then becomes your own reality. Uh, and so that's why a lot of these young men get into the lifestyle they get into because this is what everybody says I am. You know, sometimes inside, the, inside their homes, people say it's what they are. So then they become that. It's almost a self fulfilling prophecy that everybody is into. And unless, you know, uh, somebody helps them and say, no, this is not what you are, and then you can, even though people perceive you that way, you have to see yourself differently. But no, you grow up with that and you learn to navigate that. But we've always had to navigate that from, from since we've been here. Uh, it's, it's just that we've had to get help from others to learn how to do that. Uh, this is Angie Coyle. You're listening to In Deep Radio. My guests are Dory Maynard, president of the Robert C. Maynard Institute for Journalism Education in Oakland, California. That's been around for 33 years and has trained thousands of journalists of color, including the national editor of The Washington Post. Uh, Dr. Joseph Marshall is on the line, co-founder and executive director of Omega Boys Club Street Soldiers, founder of the Alive and Free Movement, and among many other credentials, a member of the San Francisco Police Commission. Uh, Dory Maynard, if we can go back for just a moment to the media depictions, because... One thing I've noticed, especially when it comes to selling movies, is that you can take a story that is so much about the black American experience, and there's almost always, to get any money attached to it, you have to put in a white protagonist through whose eyes we all see this, as though we, the general we, need a tour guide (laughs) to understand the black life. And what that tells me is that black people aren't perceived as the consumers here or the potential audience. They're the the other that needs to be examined. Well, I think it's not just that uh, we're not perceived as the audience. I think that the credibility level is so low that if you want to have your white audience identify and believe anything what they're seeing, they have to see somebody who looks like them. They very much understand in that case, by they I mean um, the movie makers, the need for people to self-identify with the people on the screen. That's where they see it. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to your general population movies, there they don't see if you want to get a black audience, you might, or an audience uh, of color, you might want to have some African American, Latino, Asian American, and Native American characters in the movie doing something other than um, acting badly. And and that that's a very rare thing, you know. Even uh, there was a Jennifer Aniston movie I saw on the plane, called "Just Go for It" or "Go with It" or something like that. It's basically an all-white movie. And then, a- apropos of absolutely nothing, in a crowd scene, you see a young African American child uh, walking with a drink in his hand, and he stops. He turns around. And he throws it at the pregnant African American woman who's right behind him, presumably his mother. She starts to run out for them, and then you go back to Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. You know, to talk about some of the, it just it brings back some of the uh, criminalization of this is a child again, nothing more than an eight year old child that we're seeing not only in the news media, but also in the entertainment media. And it sounds like a gratuitous bit. It, it was apropos of nothing. I couldn't figure it out. I, I actually went back. Uh, the next time I was flying, watch the movie again just so I could see what was that. And again, it was inexplicable. And Dr. Marshall, let's shift gears a little bit. With your work with the San Francisco Police Commission, one of the things we're seeing with the situation in Florida, and Sanford is right outside Orlando. We're, we're not talking, you know, out in the Everglades where no human beings are. This is a sophisticated urban situation. And it sounds as though the very police chief who just stepped aside temporarily today, as I say, we're recording this on Thursday, that he was brought in to deal with racial imbalances within his group. And yet, you know, here's the man who was willing to take this shooter at his word that it was self-defense, 
who let this child sit inside a morgue for three days without checking out the cell phone to see who he might belong to. What's your experience with, you know, the blue line, with with the the incorporation of racism into the police corporation, the police uh, corps? Well, we've had a, we've had our uh, officer involved shootings here in San Francisco, and, and, and as, they, as they have in other counties, um, and we've had to do thorough investigations. In, in, in some instances, you know, the officers uh, were uh, was justified. Uh, we've done a, a thorough uh, check of the facts. Um, we. Racially, by racial profiling is 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 forbidden. We try to oversee that very carefully. Um, having said, and we 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 really try to do something about that in the departments. Having said that, in a you know each officer is an individual. In this case, this was an officer, and that's the other thing. This guy was a neighborhood watch person. He wasn't a licensed. Uh, he wasn't a trained police officer. But it, it, you. you Racially biased policing is something you have to really spend a lot of time on and, and, and have officers look at the lens to, to which they look to people. Now, it, seemed like that, it just seems like there's a lot of wrong with this case. I mean, everything here sounds bad. I don't know if anything's going to come out that, that even makes any sense at all because everything we've heard up to this point is everything gone wrong, everything gone wrong. And if this gun law, which I'm just you know hearing about recently, it doesn't make any sense to me because that's almost a sounds like a license to kill. The perception allows you to shoot somebody who doesn't have a gun. None of this makes any sense. So the ire of the country should be, uh, and, and rightfully has been raised over this particular incident because it seems like everything in uh, citizens dealing with young people and in policing, you know, went haywire here. So hopefully, you know. Uh, this whole thing will be dealt with the way it should be dealt with, but we got to, you do have to do the investigation. That's what we always try and do here. You're listening to Indeep. We'll be back in, with one more segment on the Trayvon Martin issue here on Indeep Radio with Dr. Joseph Marshall and Dory Maynard. I'm Angie Cairo, and you can hear all of this again at indeepradio.com. Welcome back to In Deep. I'm Angie Coyro talking to Dr. Joseph Marshall and Dory Maynard about the issues around the Trayvon Martin shooting. And a reminder that we do record this show pre-recorded for weekend broadcast. So if you hear anything that's slightly out of date, we'll be keeping it updated on our website, indeepradio.com. And on our Twitter account, we're keeping out regular uh, broadcast in, uh, updates as well. You'll see that at in Deep Radio. Our Facebook page is In Deep with Angie Coiro. Uh, Dory Maynard, I want to pick up with you where I was just talking to Dr. Marshall, and, and that is about the issues of racism, you know, within the police forces. You know, it is a reality. Is that given a fair view in the media? Is there enough media coverage of these issues? Because these are the people who are charged with looking out for us day to day, but perhaps they're not looking out for all of us equally. Well, you know, I think what's interesting about the swirl of coverage around this case is that what it is lacking is a conversation or coverage around different people's perceptions of the criminal justice system. And I think my hope is, is as this case progresses, that we will get to that conversation. Because I think, you know, particularly all of us, we all come at issues from our own perception, our own history. And I, I think for most, and I, not all, but I think for the majority of Caucasian Americans, they have had fair and just dealings with the police department. So I think for them, it's very hard to understand uh, that there can be uh, a system that is weighted against African Americans when it comes to the criminal justice system. I think that there hasn't been enough coverage around some of the legacy of these uh, of this uh, these systems, like in Detroit, we had, or when I, I lived there briefly, there was something called stress back in the 50s that Coleman Young, as I understand, helped get rid of. But it was um, a mandate around the criminal uh, around the police department to really uh, focus on the African American community. You know, you brought up. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Marshall brought up that. When somebody does something wrong, the first thing they do is they say a black man did it. Uh, this was the case of Charles Stewart back in the late 1980s, or early 90s. He said a uh, black man killed his pregnant wife. And the police department went through the black community just 
uh, you know, um, just rounding up black men as suspects. That was covered, but it was covered as this, you know, well, this is what they're, this is the procedure they're doing. When it turned out that uh, Charles Stewart was guilty, there wasn't some coverage that went back, as I recall, that went back and looked at what this meant for the black community. Mm-hmm. And those stories do not repeatedly come up when we when we uh, encounter an issue like this. So, no, I think the coverage around the criminal justice system and race is something that really needs to be delved into in a much deeper and much more prolonged way. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a, a shooting that I, and I hope our East Coast listeners can relate to this. I encourage you to look up the story of Oscar Grant, which, which is something that happened here locally. And uh, Dr. Marshall, I know you're very familiar with your Oscar Grant was part of a scene at a, a BART station, which is our, our local tra- rapid transit line. And there was some disruption at the station. There is still dispute over how much disruption there was. To all appearances, this is a young man who was on the ground with his hands behind his back, really couldn't be in a position where he could be attacking anyone. And it was what was later portrayed as mistakenly reaching for his taser. A BART policeman instead got a gun and killed this child on the ground, just killed him on the ground. And one of the things I want to ask you about is how this story has progressed through the media. Because since then, in the blogosphere, in the comment section, when you see those horrible racist comments about, you know, this history of of black people who have shown again and again that they're not to be trusted, that black men are inherently evil or, or criminals, I've seen his name get thrown in there as though there's been some conclusive proof that he's a kid that was, as we heard with Trayvon Martin, up to no good you know, by virtue of the color of his skin, by virtue of where he is with the situation that was happening around him. And it seems as though even given the best efforts of the media and perhaps the police to get the right word out, the the young black men fall back into the same trap. It's a bad situation. There was a shooting involved. He must have been at fault. Again, it goes back to the, 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 I would call it the unbalanced portrayal of young black males. And so that question does surface. And I will say this about the Oscar Grant case. That was the first case, and and really where someone was prosecuted. Uh, The the verdict was involuntary manslaughter. I know a lot of folks felt that it was more, but the person did go to, did serve time in prison. Again, many people should have been longer, but that was one of the few times, maybe the first time I know in, 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 I believe in the East Bay Area, that someone was actually prosecuted uh, for the shooting shooting of a young black man. But to, to, to your point, this whole, this, this, it's, again, it's the lens that young black men are portrayal, and I, I think we're saying that in general in, in the way the president's treated. I mean, he's subject to the same rules as all black men, and the things that he said, things that said about him, the whole uh, this latest thing that came out, you know, the renege sign that came out. It's just the the way it, it has it has a historical as a historical lens here. And then there's, and and it just continues and continues and continues, and and we really haven't had that hard conversation. We really haven't had that conversation. I think it it, it colors everything, and when with it, it, everybody, I keep using the word colors because I think it actually fits here. Uh, as young as black men, honestly, we learn to live with that and to not, you know, not become part of that as best we can. But it's 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 just a jungle that we have to navigate. I'm really, but everybody, but we got to hold people accountable, you know, for for putting in policies and procedures that don't let happen what apparently looks like happened with Trayvon Martin. Let me just say one other thing. The other sure. thing, I am I'm glad that people are outraged. I'm really I, whenever folks are outraged at something that is unjust, I am please do so. I just wish they were as outraged if another young black man kills a black man. That's that's my only concern here. I, I want there to be this outrage. We we don't have a problem being outraged, you know, when 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 somebody white does it or when law enforcement does it. But I know that if had Trayvon just been shot, you know, and killed by another black man, there wouldn't be this outrage. Which to me says it doesn't matter if we get killed; it it matters who kills us. Yeah. And that there's a whole lot in there, right there. Dora, you want to address that? Well, that's something I've heard, um, not just from Dr. Marshall, but from several people. I, I, I think that's right. I also think that part of what sparks this outrage is uh, the lack of any kind of police accountability. Mm-hmm. You know, mo- often when an, 
a young black man kills another black man, he go he does go to prison. He gets arrested. In this case, the police came, looked at it, and said, "Never mind." And I think that, so I think it's a little bit different. I, I was I was interested to hear Dr. Marshall talking about Barack Obama and the fact that he's looked at through the same lens. I saw an article yesterday. I believe it was Slate Magazine, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, and it was an interview with people in the South as to why Barack Obama shouldn't be in office or how he, I think the article, in fact, was entitled, How Did He Get Elected Anyway? And there was this procession of slides with all these incredible things being said about Barack Obama. One of the white voters in the South went on to talk about Eric Holder. And with absolutely no sense of irony or self-awareness, he's found that man so arrogant. Eric Holder is so arrogant. Er Eric Holder had the arrogance to get educated and get appointed to office from what I can see. But here is a man who's, pretty much achieved as much as you could want to achieve in a life. And I can only imagine he's being called arrogant because what the heck is he doing in that position? Well, I think there is that that interesting standard. I mean, I, I remember after uh, Henry Louis Gates was arrested, people called him arrogant. Well, he was a Harvard professor. I don't know a lot of Harvard professors. Sorry, Harvard professors. <laughs> but Harvard professors have a reputation for what? Arrogance. <laughs> That's, and they're me, uh, Dr. Marshall. Well, I, it, it, again, I'm using that because I think the, the I'm going back to the rule and the exception. But we're all we're all covered by this blanket. We're all covered by this blanket, and and in the back of people's minds, the possibility is there again because I think of of the portrayal. The portrayal. If you take, I, I've had young people leave and you know and, and go across the world, around the world, and they go to another country. There is a lens through which they see them. It's the video lens. It's just a, I've had, my son went to London. They went to Brixton. They said, he was from Oakland. They said, where's your gun? So, I mean, th it's not the content of character piece. It is, you know, and, and, and it is really the color of your skin, and your color of your skin carries this lens. But let me just say one other thing I, I was talking about, the, 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 the outrage. See, my thing is that, it, to me, it's accountability. We, have, we, don't, hold, we don't hold each other and our communities to the same accountability standard that we hold the police. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I mean, yes, the police should be held accountable, but we should also held, hold ourselves as accountable. It's not that yeah, this is wrong, all of them are wrong, and I just don't see the same standard. And that, to me, allows the, the, all the other killings not to, not to be dealt with. Uh, we don't tell, we don't snitch, we don't talk. If a police officer does it, we'll talk in a minute. So. I'm just, I look at all the factors in here. In this case, we're going to do something. In many cases, people aren't going to tell at all. Well, that goes back, Dory, to what you were saying about the different experiences of, of the police as, as either a guiding force or an opposing enemy. Um, in a white community, if something goes wrong, you call the police. If In a white community, if something goes wrong and the police come out to investigate it, you want to help because whatever just went wrong, you don't want that to happen again. And the stakes are very different if that same crime were to be called in, in a black community. That it, yes, and I I'm going to yield to Dr. Marshall who has a little more experience on this, but uh, I'm really much more familiar with the media coverage around these issues. Do you, but do you see the media acknowledging that? Do you see that? No, as I do not see the media acknowledging that uh, at all. And this is again it goes. This is a a story that runs through uh, the last few decades at least, and. Each time it happens, the media treats it as if it is a news story and then does not go and double down and really look at what it means for various community members. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Marshall, in, in the situation that I outlined then, uh, I guess it's one thing for me to sit with my experience and say, well, gosh, you know, they really need to, whoever lives in that neighborhood needs to speak up. They need to go to the cops. They need to expose whatever crime has just happened in their neighborhood. It's another thing to hear it from you because your life experience is very different from mine. I guess part of me thinks, gee, if I thought someone were going to retaliate against my person or my child or my car, maybe I'd be a lot more reluctant to speak up. Um, you're right. You're absolutely right. But <laughs> historical experience has shown that we can do that. See, I hear the argument all the time, but historical experience shows that we face retaliation. We face retaliation from the Klan. We face retaliation. There are people who walk in the South. You know, the Freedom Riders, we face that. So to me, you know, they were able to do that and make substantial changes. 
I, I don't think that should be a. Re- I mean, you got to decide how you want to live. Absolutely, you can face it from your, you can face it from your own neighbors. Okay, so this is just our total experience, and until we decide what's important is how we live, you know, and 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 the risks that we take. People know, for example, that I tell you do something in my community, I'm telling. Everybody knows that. So guess what? Nobody does anything around me. All right, and and. And I think at some point you got to decide what, what stand you're going to take. And you have to work with people. That's one reason I'm on the commission. I'm going to make sure the police do it right. Could I be in jeopardy? Absolutely. But is it worth it? To me, it certainly is. What do you hear from the black people on the San Francisco police force, the black men and women who serve me? They must certainly have some, some conflicted loyalties out there. Uh, there are a lot of great officers. There are a lot of great officers, a lot of great officers. The problem, here's the problem with, with, with police. If, 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 because of the uniform you wear, one officer can mess it up for anybody. That's why I always tell the officers, you got to make sure you got rid of bad apples because they put you in danger. They, they, they shed a, a poor light on you. That's a, the, the, part of the difficulty with departments is that the good cops often can't, uh, don't seem to be able to do anything about the bad ones. So then they're tainted by the same lens. And as what I what I try to get officers to understand, you don't want anybody that's guilty of misconduct or even you know that you think in that way because it messes it up for you because you got to go back in those communities and you won't be able to do good work. I also, tell officers, you know, there's a way to police that 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 that's extremely effective, and and that's one of the things we're trying to teach officers. School resource officers, for example, have an entirely different different lens in the way they act than do than do other officers. I think we've got to do a lot more of that when it comes to policing. But remember, this guy wasn't even a policeman, so you got you got you got a bunch of other issues here. Yeah, and I should note, although he's being identified, this is George Zimmerman, the uh, the alleged attacker we're talking about. Although he's been identified as the as the captain or the overseer of a so community group, right. yeah, the, right. it was not a registered neighborhood. Uh, neighborhood watch. He, there's no uh, apparently a lot of these do file with the local police. This neighborhood watch was not filed with police. He may well have just been a self styled one. Uh, we're mm-hmm. coming to the close of the hour, Dory, and, and I don't want to leave us alone without taking a look through your eyes at what the media can do from this point forward in covering the story to improve what they've done to to keep the story alive and to cover it accurately and wholly. Well, I think part of what we've talked spent some time talking about today is to take a, a deep look at the criminal justice system and how it. Uh, how it uh, differs, the results differ depending on your community. The other thing I would like to see is on a go-forward basis that we begin to make sure that the picture we're telling, uh, the picture we're showing of black and brown boys and men is accurate, it's complete. It it stops over-representing people in crime and begins to show the everyday nuanced reality of, of boys and men of color and their lives. In some cases, are we asking people to move away from, you and I were talking about movies and television earlier, are we asking people to move away from what they know to be profitable to what they might feel like, well, if I change the way I do this, I'm going to lose my audience? You know, I have enough faith in, in the American public to believe that an accurate and fair picture of boys and men of color is not going to repel the majority of people. In fact, I think rather than that, you'll begin to regain your credibility. You know, uh, as we look at the the traditional news industry, which is going through a, just a massive disruption, one of the things that I would urge people to look at is the fact that they're, they have not been accurately and fairly reflecting everybody, and perhaps that's why they're losing such a large portion of their audience. And I think with the com- company country becoming more diverse, that's just sound business sense. Mm-hmm. I want to thank both of you for being with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Marshall, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome very much, man. And we'll put links to his work at the Omega Boys Club, Street Soldiers Alive and Free, and San Francisco Police Commission Online. Dory Maynard, it's a joy to have you in the studio. Thanks very much. Thank you. Likewise, we will link to her work at the Robert C. Maynard Institute for Journalism Education in Oakland. In our next hour, In Deep goes on the job. Hard labor, tough privacy questions, and how to get a union in the door. You can follow us on Twitter at In Deep Radio or on Facebook as In Deep with Angie Coyro. Our executive producer is Gordon Whiting. Matt Fiddler is our engineer. Our theme is by Big Trouble's David Gans provides our closing music. Visit us online at indeep.com for web-only extras this week from Political Carnival's Gotta Laugh and more. And stick around for more In Deep. But I'd rather live my-
my own damn way We'll take our culture back someday But it's gonna get worse before it gets better It's gonna get worse before it gets better It's gonna get worse before it gets better But I know it's gonna get better Thanks for tuning in this week to In Deep, which is a production of Live from the Left Coast. You can get more information on the show and our company at LFTLC.com. Live from the Left Coast. While you're there, you can become a member and support our work. We have a separate website for the show that is indeep.org. If you have any questions or feedback, there's a contact button right there, indeep.org. We are developing a recurring series on mental health issues in our country, especially in this economy. And you're a big part of that. We'd like your topic suggestions, your stories, and your questions. Send them in via our website, the contact button at indeep.org. Join us again this time next week for two more hours of in-depth conversation. I'm Angie Cuero. Thanks, and we will see you then. You're listening to WPWC, 1480 AM, Dumfries, Virginia. We Act Radio, home of Washington's progressive working community.